um, in less than an hour, I figured maybe, and I don't want to break that up too much. Uh, are you guys interested in a little bit about trade psychology stuff that I've learned? Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. And maybe I can get into a little bit about my own past and you know how I got to this point and whatever, just to give you some perspective. Yeah. Yeah, I want a box of tissues. <laughs> to, to, yeah. Well, anyway, um, I just have a sip of this anyway to get started. Because I've been around the block with this stuff. And I know some, you know, I've had some interesting questions from folks that I get pretty often too is, why are you doing this? Why do you have an advisory service instead of just trading for yourself and all that? I think if you understand where I've been, it kind of uh, it kind of comes into perspective. But you know, there are some other psychology things I want to talk about too. Um, I started trading back in 1990, um, and no, I haven't been trading continuously since then. I mean, we all have breaks. You know, in, in this, you get burned out or whatever, um, especially when you're starting out and everything you're doing is relatively high stress. But um, the reason I got into it in the first place was because um, I was, before that, I was doing some real estate stuff. And believe it or not, I took a couple, you know, you think about what year that was, 1986 to 1990, there were a lot of these no money down things on TV for real estate. So, you know, and I was young at that point, right? So, so I ended up um, taking a couple of these no money down courses. Something actually worked out from it. I was I, I did end up you know owning a, a pretty big property for a while, but what I did was being um, kind of computer oriented. Even back then, I had this old Macintosh. Um, I did a spreadsheet to um, help me evaluate properties and to basically spit out boilerplate offers on the properties. I, I would put in the rent roll and you know all everything that a real estate agent you know was giving me about the property, and um, I'd stick it in to the spreadsheet and it would actually generate a nice little thing with ex explaining how I wanted the financing to work and I put it in a little binder and basically do a hundred of those and find a lead on one property. It was something involving sort of a form of owner financing so it had to be a specific kind of person who was into it. Um, and I ended up owning, uh, being a, a partner in ownership of a, of a 50 unit apartment building in New York and we were, got involved in converting it to co-ops and all that stuff um, which was a very you know long and drawn out and labor intensive process. I took a class at the Learning Annex in New York given by a co-op attorney, so got into that. You know, I was always into let me learn and let me, you know, explore what I want to do with this stuff. But because we had a lot of downtime, since we owned the property and had to manage it and all that, um, I started looking around at other investment opportunities and it struck me that if I could do this spreadsheet, to, uh, to spit out these offers for properties, why can't I do something with the financial markets also? Where I could take you know, current prices and all that and come up with all kinds of different possibilities. My clues about that came from, this used to be very popular, there was a publishing company, or maybe it still is, uh, Hume Investing. H-U-M-E, and they have this thing called the Super Investor Files, and I own them, yes. Most of them are no longer valid at all. But the Super Investor Files, and they have these interesting, really low-risk spread situations. The first first chapter, the TED spread, the T-bill euro dollar spread, which I actually did. Um, so they had these things that were supposed to give you really nice big returns at very low risk, but you had to do stuff like look at the newspaper every day. This is pre-electronic anything, okay? You had to look at the newspaper every day and and uh, look for the quotes on specific securities and track by hand when the quotes were in certain places in relation to each other, because we're talking about spreads, and look for those circumstances to change for an entry. So I was like, okay, I did these spreadsheets for the real estate. Let me do spreadsheets for uh, automating, essentially, those Yum situations, right? The super investor situations. So I started programming all that, and I was going around to different bookstores and stuff too, and I, all of a sudden, I was like, what's that magazine, Futures? There's a magazine called Futures? That's really weird. I, I had no idea, and I picked it up, and took it home, kind of like a boy with his first porno, and, <laughs> you know, and I was like, wait a second, this has all been done before. I'm trying to reinvent the wheel. There's, there's all these automated things out there and all these charting packages, and, and uh, I had no idea, so I studied, I thought. And I ended up buying this thing. Um, I don't know if I should say the name of it because they're still kind of in business. And it was a it was a black box system. Okay, it was a black. You all know what a black box is. Yeah. 
Okay, so it was a black box system and the charts looked really nice and you could, it was mostly commodities and you could put in, um, you know, that you wanted the back testing done and the back testing looked wonderful. The back testing looked great. Everything, everything, yeah, it had acceptable losses. It did report losses. Back testing looked wonderful. Um, but then when you actually ran it in real time, what it was doing was this. The market would be going down and it would generate a buy signal and it would do this and they never said get out or anything and then the market would go down again and guess what it generated another buy trigger here and the market went down and it generated another buy trigger here in the back testing the only buy trigger that was reported was the last one <laughs> okay so um, I actually remember this is how stupid I was about not educating myself and about the markets in general. My first commodities trade, I bought palladium. Okay. <laughs> well, the thing back tested well on palladium. And I bought, I, I don't remember at this. I, I might have, maybe I blocked it out. Um, I, so I bought palladium, and um, what happened was it, it was going up that day, and it was like very cool when it was going up, and then the next morning it opened with a gap down. I was like, how can it do that? <laughs> what do you mean a gap down? I didn't know anything about that because my stupid little automated black box trading system didn't show you that that kind of thing happened. So here I was basically playing without educating myself first. Well, that thing got shelved. And I studied other materials in, you know, in Futures Magazine and whatever else I could get my hands on at that moment. Um, and uh, of course, there was no internet, you know, so I couldn't look around at who was a good, tra good, good uh, trading educator, whatever. I liked some of the articles that I was reading um, about and by Dr. Alexander Elder. Some of you may have heard of him, Dr. Elder. Um, yeah, and I lived at that point, I lived on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and he had his trading office in Queens. And uh, he was teaching a thing that he called the triple screen trading system. Okay, the triple screen trading system, all that meant was you were using three time frames, basically. You were using, a, a, it was the S&P, the big contract back then was 500 bucks a point. Okay, it was before they split it, you know, into 250. Um, and uh, you were using 15 minute for trend and, and uh, five minute for entry and then, uh, you know, a tighter thing for the, for the refining it and all this stuff. Um, so I took his course, I took his class and it was very cool. I remember still what it felt like going out to Queens on the subway and he had a trading office above like a deli or something. Um, and it was great stuff and it really worked. Um, and I think, the, I think that's really when I got turned on to the idea of multiple time frames being essential. Um, it worked very well. The markets were much, much slower then because this is pre-electronic. All right, that's why it wasn't scary to deal with a $500 a point contract. There was no electronic order entry. What I would do is pick up the phone and call my broker. This is for day trading, I'm talking about. Pick up the phone, call my broker, place the order. 90 seconds later, they would call me back with a fill and I would place the stop. And when it became time to trail the stop, I would call them up. That's what it was like. And the market moved slowly enough to make that possible. It, it, was, it was really interesting that way. So I made some money. And then I made, I guess you could call it a mistake. Um, in hindsight, you could call it a mistake. I could call it a growth experience. Um, I started a fund. I started a fund, a pool. Yeah, back then it was called, it was called a commodities pool. And I took some money from friends and acquaintances and I started trading it and we were doing okay. We were doing okay. And then, again, pre-internet, I couldn't send out reports saying, you know, here's the status of your account, whatever. So the people who had invested with me ended up calling me all the time. How do we do today? How do we do today? They, they weren't as interested really in the profits, I don't think. They were living vicariously through what I was doing. And what happened then, and this is where the psychology lesson comes into play, I would sit there in front of the computer the next day and I would be scared to make the trade. I'd be, I got trigger shy. I'd be afraid to make the trade because, of, well, if this loses, I have to tell Sharon this afternoon that the account is down. Okay, and that burned me out really quickly. It burned me out to the point where I didn't even want to look at a chart. I did not want to look at a chart at all. And um, what year are we right now? Ninety-one. 
Okay, 91. And uh, I, I'm sorry, I should have done the timeline. Uh, 1272 of 1990 is. Um, yeah. So, um, so anyway, I stopped. I stopped. I folded the thing. Um, I had some money in my pocket from that. Oh, we sold the apartment building well before that. And basically um, broke even on that scenario because of, something, because of something in the legalities of the co-op arrangement. But I had some money from trading you know, up until I quit. So I, I goofed off for a while. I, I became a bartender and a club promoter, because I was living at that point in the East Village, you know, and I was, I was into that idea of chilling out, seeing where life would take me and all this stuff. And um, I, I socked away some money from bartending. Actually, my trading stake, because I went through my money from trading before that, my trading stake for getting back into the market was from bartending, um, you know, which was fun, but obviously a lot of hard work. So um, I took a long, long break from trading. Still, you know, didn't study, but still got Futures Magazine and still read it and all that. And I got really tired of Manhattan several years back, um, you know, around 2000. Actually, a long time, I guess, you know, almost a decade at this point. And I was debating, you know, do I want to move to another city? What do I want to do and all that? And I was, you know, what I really need is to change my career, you know, stop bartending. And what, what has always appealed to me, the trading. That's what always appealed to me. So I fired everything up, you know, got my software updated and all that, and looked at the markets, and they were totally different. They were completely different. Are we graduated from 1991 to another year now? 2000. About 2000. 2000. Yeah, I'm just telling you, I had a history back there. That's why years are important because the markets change. Yes, a lot. yeah, the markets change, and and you know a lot of a lot of things change. Markets became too fast. By the I, I basically futzed around for a few years until about 2003. I was not sure what I was seeing on the charts. So by that time, the ES was getting big, and everything was electronic, and it was moving so much faster than I could deal with with that old triple screen thing, which was great, but it just wasn't working at that point. Um, so I remember the first thing I, I, did, I didn't realize at that point, I had no idea that there was so much going on online about trading, not just order entry, but people talking about trading. I found forums where there were conversations going on. I found the Elite Trader Forum. That led me to Woody. Woody's chat room. You guys, some of you guys know Woody, and some of you don't. Um, CCI. Um, but Woody, you know, I, I became a moderator in his room. Also, I, I got turned on to what was going on there. Um, you know, as far I was really into it, and I was into the idea that there was everyone helping each other in this chat room. Um, that was 2003. If you give me track of dates, I'm taking notes on me. Um, uh, but you could write down that's Dave in 2003, not Mark. Um, Where was Brian? Uh, Brian? Yeah, Brian was Brian was living the high life. Um, and then then I met uh, Carolyn Baroden. Oh, in between uh, during 2000 to 2003, I took a course by this guy uh, Todd Mitchell, trading concepts, whatever. Todd Mitchell, uh, that was a total. Nothing, as far as I was concerned. Um, I mean, it was a lot of money for it. It had some nice ideas. One of the things he talks about is fib, but it's old style fib where he's just going, you know, low to high, one retracement swing, and which one's going to hold, and that kind of stuff. I did get turned on to Keltner channels there. I mean, I got some good ideas, but I also discovered that, you know, he would talk about, he would send out a daily chart or a chart at the end of the day showing the trades that could have been taken during the day, and it was like, oh, really? It didn't look anything like that while, you know, because you could have made a few points off this one, you know, things like that, violating his own rules and all this stuff. So I got I got turned off to that after spending, I don't even know. Then I bought I, got, I bought Trade Station when it was still two thousand I. So that was another twenty five hundred dollars. When it was two thousand I, I bought from Todd some automated indicators that he had this guy program, and I was just looking at this whole mess of things and I didn't know what the heck it was telling me. So I got into the into the Woody CCI thing a little bit. Meanwhile, what you're hearing is a discovering, discovery process. I wasn't comfortable with what I was seeing, um, at, but I also wasn't flitting around from thing to thing. You know, I wasn't going, what about this indicator? What about that? I'm talking about a period of years you know, where I tried to get things to sink in, and it just really wasn't working for me. So I was in Woody's, and then I met Carolyn when she did a presentation in, in Woody's room, and, uh, and it really made a lot of sense to me. She has a lot of stuff about FIB, and how the FIB, you know, the FIB clustering together and all that, and I saw how that could have been used um, to filter CCI triggers. Uh, of course, Woody's CCI is very different than the CCI I use. 
Um, and so, you know, I got, I got to be friends with Carolyn. I was in her chat room for a while, and I ended up working with her, and because I really was learning stuff. Um, what happened then, I was, I was trading. I started trading using what I could see with CCI together with her FIB work. I did a workshop with her in 2003 where I was showing you know, my trades and triggers in relation to her FIB work. Um, and then what happened, this is where, this answers the question hopefully about why am I splitting myself between trading and, and advising. Um, my mom got really sick. My mom, she's still around. She's still around, she's doing better. But she got really, really sick. And it was a situation where it was really best for me to be together with her. And to help her through this process, I was actually kind of nursing, you know, nursing her during this time. Very, very long recoveries from some major spinal surgery. And I knew from my past experience with being distracted while trading that I couldn't possibly put money on the line myself. I couldn't, I could not, I knew I would just mess up completely. I could not take that kind of, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. But I didn't want to back away from the markets again. So I said, what I'm going to do instead is study during this time. I will look at the charts every day. And I will apply myself to mastering as best I can the stuff that is now calling to me. And I'm not going to give myself the pressure even of trying to trade right now. So I started taking daily charts. Moved away from TradeStation, by the way, completely. Um, I was just using e-signal charting at that point, and then of course I met the Fibonacci trader folks, and they incorporated some changes that I wanted into the tools. And I started by by running a whole bunch of daily charts so that I could do the Fib work and um, and analyze, you know, over a longer term period. So I wasn't trying to focus on a 15 minute chart and all that. I would do 10 stocks. The next day I would do 10 more stocks, and I'd look to see how the first 10 worked out. I applied myself completely to that. And after a while, you know, I was, like I said, I was working with Carolyn. I used to run her chat room at times. Um, we did a couple of workshops together, and I realized I'm making a few bucks by being involved in the business end of this business as well. Um, I, I had a couple of people approach me, a bunch of people approached me to do a chat room, and I didn't want to do it because I felt that would be competitive with Carolyn also. Um, they liked the way I explained things better than, you know, better than the way she explained things. Some people like how she explains things better than the way I explain things. It's just the way it is. Um, but I did have people approach me who said they wanted me to do longer term charts for them. They had a, sp a specific longer term investment in mind. And Carolyn, if you ask her to do something that's not part of her thing, she goes, go away. You know, so she's in, she doesn't want to be bothered with something that's not, you know, not her deal um, at the moment. So I said, sure, why not? And they said, well, how do we pay you? You know, so, so oh, okay, I can, I can do this. I can do this while I'm still chopping ice for my mother because she can't drink liquid right now and she needs to suck on ice too. I can still do that. So I got into doing that. And then as the health situation got better with her, I got back into my own trading. But by that time, I had a bunch of people who were kind of like, hey, do you have time to do this chart? Here's 100 bucks, you know, whatever. So I was splitting my time between those things. And... Um, I still am, essentially, and it's okay. I go through, you know, a, a thing at times where I'm sort of like, well, if I gave up any kind of advisory capacity, I could focus full time on the trading. I tried that a couple of years ago. I tried that, and I was lonely. Now that we have the intraday chat room thing going, I was lonely, and I also I would see something like that crown, and I would be like, well, who do I tell? <laughs> who do I tell? So what did I do? I made everything free. I made everything free that I was doing. And I said, hey, everyone, you know, we can do a chat room anyway. And I'll, I'll even do a daily report. And it's all free. And everything on my site is free and all that. Well, then what happened was I ended up with 10 million people stopping in for two seconds, asking me a zillion questions and taking off again. So I had to find a balance with it. That's why I'm doing the advisory stuff and taking my own trades. Obviously, I could focus completely on my own trades if I stopped the advisory service. I like the idea of going, you know what, I don't really feel like trading this week for whatever reason. At least I know my bills are paid. That's why the because I am good at this. And other people can benefit from it. So that's why I'm splitting my time that way. Lessons I've learned over the years. You're welcome. That's my history with it. And I could fill in all kinds of blanks and details there too, but that's that's the oversight. Um, what have I learned? Uh, study. Study. 
find something that appeals to you and apply yourself to it. All right. Um, these charts might look complicated to you and it might look like a whole bunch of things on those charts, but I've seen people show me charts with a million indicators. There's so many indicators it obscures price. You can't even see price. To me, these charts tell a story because I've studied them for so long. They're not complicated at all. They're very, they're very simple to me. It's very hard to impart all of that to you in two and a half days. You know, of course, so this stuff looks new and complicated, um, but it's a heck of a lot easier than some of the folks I deal with who have added indicator in it because this one's not working. So they add something else, or they, you know, they, they look at CCI for one week and it had a losing trade. So I'm going to go over to RSI, or I'm going to use MACD. You're not going to get anywhere that way at all. And I'm not talking about people who are just starting either. I'm talking about people I know have done this for 10 years, and they're still. And then, then the question becomes, what's your motive actually? Are you trying to make money, or are you playing? You know. Did you? Interesting thing you just, you just touched on um, CCI, which I, I'm not familiar with. Right. We're, we're accustomed to the. Um, MACD, Stochastic, RSA, mm -hmm. and the LS. Mm -hmm. In terms of incorporating this, do we dispose of any of those or just add this? Yeah. Do what you're comfortable with. The question was, should we get rid of any of that stuff, other indicators? If you're comfortable reading those, it's like I was saying yesterday, just the best thing I can focus you on today is the FIB work and showing you where and relate, you know, that's when you focus on your indicators when there's a FIB setup. Um, the CCI happened to call to me. It just happens to be something that I can read, so I focused on that. But yeah, you don't want to flit around from one thing to another. You don't want to keep, yes, Richard? Yeah, that's, uh, that's what I heard Hubert say a couple weeks ago when he did that webinar. Uh -huh. Bless you. Hubert Centers, uh -huh. he's with the trade markets. He said the reason that most people uh, fail at the trading is exactly what they want. They try this, and it doesn't work. Let's go to something else. Right. It doesn't give it a, a, a good chance, and then they want to trade right. everything. Yeah, they want to trade everything. This, That's this and that. Is specialize and stick with your plan. We have a couple of people in the chat room now, Gary, who, um, not Gary, but someone, so a couple of people we know, who are flitting in and out because what happens is they say, Mark, your CCI triggers are great. Oh no, I had a losing trade. Maybe I was better off with that other MACD. Maybe I was, you know what? I love the ES with the CCI. Oh, I had a losing trade. Now I'm trading the Euro. Now, wondering why you're not being successful. I'm not saying you have to stick with one security only, but because you had a losing trade, that's grail seeking to go from one thing to another. Are you going to ask something? I thought you had a question. You're just, yes? Uh, on your CCI there, when you said it, you're using the 100, correct? The 100 lines, not a 100 period. Are you just talking the one above the zero or both one below? Can we wait on that until I'm actually talking about triggers? Would be helpful. Yeah, yeah, because I'd like to cover this stuff before lunch. That would be great. Thank you. Um, but yes, it's both plus 100 and minus 100. Um, so, other things, other things I've learned about this stuff um, sim trading. Sim trading is a very good thing when you're learning a trading methodology. You're learning a system. You're learning the order entry system and all that stuff. And again, I'm talking for, I'm talking about uh, shorter term traders. Longer term traders, it's not. You don't even need an order entry system, obviously, if you're talking about longer term positions. But sim trading, as everyone has read, I'm going to give you another little twist on that, though. As everyone has read, you don't have the um, the uh, psychological commitment to the trade. All right, lots and lots of people make a million dollars in a year sim trading, and the second they put actual cash on the line, <laughs> deer in the headlights time. You know, and it's totally different when you actually have your money in there. Pattern that I really don't like, I've talked about this before at other workshops, I see this every day when I'm talking to traders, um, is they go back and forth constantly between sim and cash. Back and forth constantly, and what happens then, invariably, you end up with a situation where you have a losing trade in cash. You have another losing trade in cash. So you go to SIM <laughs> to prove to yourself once again that the system you're using works. So then you have a winning trade in SIM. Then you have another winning trade in SIM. I think I need one more winning trade in SIM. Do I take this one live or do I take it SIM? Causing tension. Do I take it live or do I take it in SIM? Take it in SIM. Another winning trade. Go back to cash. Have a losing trade. Why? Because you're not going to win every trade and you just set yourself up with a cycle where all of your winning trades to prove it to yourself are in SIM. 
statistically you end up with a losing trade when you're back in cash. What works for me, not for everyone necessarily, but what works for me with that is to set aside a block of time. I am going to sim for one month and build stats that I can then see. How am I doing on the trading? What's my profitability? How much is a trade averaging in my favor? How much is it averaging against? If I have good results, I'm going to cash and sticking with cash. And that's the way it is. If I have a losing streak for a period of time where I feel I have to reevaluate all that, then I can go back to sim. But I'm not going to jump back and forth and back and forth on every single trade. And that doesn't, it actually it does apply to longer term too. You're just not doing the same kind of rapid fire order entry. Do not trade to escape something else. Okay? You're, just, you're upset about something? First of all, you're upset about something just like what I said about my mom. I knew I couldn't trade then. I knew I'd be distracted. Distracted physically when she called me to help her and distracted mentally and emotionally about what was going on. But I still see people who are going, you know, um, oh, you know, I, I, I hurt myself and I'm, I'm in pain and I'm taking pain medication and I'm, I'm you know, I, I, I blah, blah, blah and all that and I'm still trading. And I wonder why, even though I'm taking pain pills every day, I wonder why I'm not winning. Don't do that. Don't go, I'm upset at my wife and I'm angry and I'm going to sit down and trade. You know, ask yourself, what are you doing there? Are you, are you really trying to distract yourself from something else? Or am I in this as a business? Trading is a business. That's the other thing. What's really annoying? People who just think they can sit down there at the computer when they want to trade and turn it on and it's an ATM. It should, it should pop out cash without, without studying away from the market. You have to study away from the market. You must study away from the market. When you're not in the midst of it, you study, you look at your trades, screenshot every trade is a good thing. Every trade you take, use a screenshot utility. Take a picture of it, annotate it. Trades you almost took but decided not to for some reason, screenshot it, annotate. Why didn't I take it? After the market, study that stuff. That's when you want to be really serious about things like that. It's a business. It's not, it's not suddenly you know, a turnkey situation. A, a store owner has to do his inventory at night too when he's not on the floor. You know, so that's, that is essential. Understand more about yourself in relation to trading. Here's a book that I can really recommend. Amazon, 17 bucks, not a huge investment. This is by Van Tharp. V-A-N-T-H-A-R-P. He has been around for a long, long time. He is a trading psychologist, money management expert. Okay? Yeah, V A N. Right. Tharp. T H A R P. This is his newest book. It's called Super Trader. He has a whole bunch, he has books and he has some very expensive courses that you can take, but this is a good compilation. Uh, if you don't, wanna, you don't know enough about him, you don't want to commit to a thousand dollar home study course, you can buy this book for seventeen dollars. And what this book does is he leads you through understanding more about yourself, what kind of trader you're, you're better suited. Someone said to me yesterday, well I am scalping but I'd rather be a longer term trader. Well, he gets into, are you really better off being a longer term trader or are you better off accepting yourself as a scalper? Based upon your own psychological needs, what kind of money management strategy would be best for you? See, the thing about other trading psychologists is they're all kind of touchy-feely, the ones I know there. Well, you have to overcome your fears and learn to ride the wave and probably be afraid to press the button and take the trade or you let your losses run. La, 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 just pretend you're surfing and visualize. Then you have the money management people who are like, do this math. And do the, if you do this math, he has a combination. He, he, he's, he has a practical approach. And instead, I could go on about stuff that I've learned along these lines for another whole day and a half or two days. This is the expert. So I just suggest you make a little investment and, you know, and, and do this. And it's very readable too. Some of his earlier materials are not as readable as far as I'm concerned. So this, he has exercises you can go through to find really what kind of trader are you? What are your fears? Why do you have those fears? How can you tweak your trading plan to overcome those fears or work with them? It makes a big difference. Trading plan, another issue. Have one. 
Have one. Doesn't matter how simple it is. I'm going to show you my trading plan. Well, an earlier version of it because it focuses only on Forex. Later on, I'll show you my trading plan. It's one page. It's one page. That's all you need, but you need it. You need it. I see so much stress and tension from people who are, oh, I'm so stressed out trading because I don't know if I should run this trade this way. I don't know if I should let this one run. And Oh, I think I will because it's really moving. No wonder you're stressed out. Figure all that stuff out in advance and run the trade based on what you figured out by studying the night before and the night before that. Run your trade based on that. If you have any confidence that you're into so that you're doing something that works correctly over the long run, that you have an edge, that takes the stress out of managing the trade. Okay. Mark Douglas is fine. I, I've read Discipline Trader and Trading in the Zone. I like Van Thorpe better because Mark, Mark Douglas doesn't go into the uh, combining. Yeah, Van Thorpe goes into the head work and how you can actually apply that to your to your day to day trading or monthly whatever. Um, oh, quick little aside thing. Get to know your computer. Get to know your computer and what the internet can do for you. Anything you need to know about trading, anything you need to know about, um, you know, about uh, running your computer itself, optimizing it, don't be afraid of your computer. Your computer is your big tool in this, in this field. Make sure it's running properly. I mean, that's a pet peeve of mine, tech issues, but I see that hang up traders so many times. And I really wanted to trade. I missed that trade because my computer froze. Take your computer to Geek Squad at Best Buy. Have them fix it. Take a local computer class. Learn what is going on inside that thing so you can be a little bit more familiar. It's your tool. You know how to sharpen a pencil. That's the architect's tool. Know what this thing is about. Otherwise, you're in the wrong business. You, can't, you wouldn't be a cab driver if you didn't know how to drive, you know? But the point of cab driver, you know, is really. Mm. Yes. Yeah. The, the, the one thing I want to underline for everybody here is the money management tools that Vantor teaches are probably the absolute best there is in the business. If you haven't read anything by Van Kator about money management, I suggest highly that you follow money. So yeah, he has earlier, I mean, uh, you know, uh, um, he has an earlier book that's great. And yes, Trader Rate of Financial Freedom, I have a hypey title, I think, so Super Trader. He has classes, as I said, he does seminars. But if you want it, you know, if you want the greeting card version that's very readable and a good way to get into it, it's this book. Money management, you know, that's another thing why I said triggers are not the most important thing in the world. Money management is. What you're going to do. Does everyone in here know exactly how much of your account to put into each trade? Or is it scary when you put a trade? That's one way of doing it. Is it scary when you go, you know, a lot of the reasons people are afraid to take a trade is because they don't really know if that trade goes against them. How is it going to impact their account? You must have all that stuff figured out in advance. Yes? You gave up trade station. Uh, uh yeah. So just execute trades? No, I, I had TradeStation 2000i before it had execution. <coughs> okay, and what happened was I started to get into the FIB work, and as soon as I ran an extension, the program crashed by, with a divide by zero error. So little... I had no reason to go back to it. Yeah. Uh, and it's, see, I got into the FIB work, I got to Fibonacci Trader, and it's so much easier to use. TradeStation, people come to me, they're using TradeStation, that's 10 more steps to do the same thing I do in two. You know? Now I'm going to touch on something, though, a little bit. A little bit funny, a little bit um, um, bizarre, but one thing also, I told you, be very, very serious in your studies, okay? Be very serious in your studies, but when it comes time to trade, I want you to see if you can have a sense of humor. I want you to see if you can keep things light. We noticed, well, can't really help but noticing, in my chat room, we crack a lot of jokes. We have a lot of stuff going on, a lot of humor, when there's nothing happening in the market, um, when, but light, yeah, it lightens things up. It's a nice thing that it lightens them up. Um, most of the humor that we use is about bizarre circumstances. We have someone in the chat room we love dearly, RG, who um, posts bizarre stuff, news of the weird, absurdities, juxtapositions, and so on. And a couple of weeks ago, it was interesting, I like it because it keeps, thank you, it keeps the, um, keeps the atmosphere light. It's unpleasant to be working with people who are and also it means you didn't do your work. You're not comfortable. Did you get one? Yeah. Yeah. 
but you're not comfortable with what's that? Yeah, I was afraid that wouldn't work. Yeah, I had a reason. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, it keeps the atmosphere better. Okay. Um, it keeps your head better if you're that tense. Actually, you guys could pass these down there if you would. Yeah. Just down this way. I think that's enough. Uh, here, it doesn't matter. But this article came out in the Times a couple of weeks ago about, this was really interesting, how working with the absurd, recognizing the absurd and getting jarred by it, startled with it, increases your ability to recognize patterns. Out of the box. Okay, yes. Out of the box. Yeah. So if you're there and you're staring at your chart and you're focused on your chart and there's no, and I can't stand these people are cracking jokes. I've had people leave my service because we're cracking jokes. And I won't change that. Okay, because first of all, if they're that wound up, um, they didn't do the research. They didn't do the research. They should be chilled out. You got that in a link, actually. Um, but you can have a hard copy. But read this article. I thought it was really, really interesting because it talks about how if you see something weird, Monty Python-esque humor, those of you who are my age know what that is, if you see something weird and you laugh at it, a part of the brain starts focusing on finding patterns. So all the more reason. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not serious. I'm not kidding. You're welcome. Besides, walking back here gave me a chance to see what everyone's doing. Who's reading their email? Well, I can give an example. I'm coming to make an LFP domino, but if I go through this, it's very serious. Yeah. If I make a you know, laugh and a cry or something, I win. You know, when I'm like, when I'm serious, I don't win. Well, you know what happened? It's funny. This article made me think about something, too. All of the successful traders I know have a sense of humor. And the sense of humor comes out when they are trading as well. Not necessarily executing a trade, you know, not necessarily actually in the trade, but when they're looking at their charts, talking about trading, there's a lot of humor. The, the unsuccessful traders I know, the ones who are struggling, is humorless. And they maybe have a higher sense of acuity when they're trading, you know, looking, you know, more alert. Maybe this is why, but it talks about the article. Yeah. But it's interesting, if you think about it, think about who's in the chat room. You know, how we crack jokes, who's, who, who do we know are the successful traders? The ones who are... Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Any kind of, any kind of brain intensive feel. Anything, basically what this is saying is by letting your left brain go to sleep for a bit and playing around with imagery in your right brain, it activates that left brain math analytical stuff. It's fun too. That's fun too, but underlying that, this research is saying that, you know what? If you go there, where's a gurgly pattern? Where's a gurgly pattern? Is that a gurgly or a crown? No, you know what? Look at the picture of someone who is like, you know, opening their head and pouring water in it and laugh at the, you know, Monty Python kind of thing. Look at something bizarre. Look at, oh yeah, a woman drove car into a um, store and tried to buy something because she was, that's what we look at, news of the weird. You know, we always go, okay, that's Florida. You know, that's what, you know, woman, woman drives to the police and tries to report the person who sold her bad crack. You know, that's Florida. So, so that, okay, you're all laughing. Where's the Gartley? That's the thing, is it's going to reinvigorate you. It's going to reinvigorate you. Um, anyone want to ask me anything about the psychology stuff and the, what I haven't covered with it? Because these, these are just notes. What, what's up? What do you think of know that in Oh yes, physical trading environment. Thank you. Make sure you're comfortable. Make sure your ergonomics are good. In other words, don't try to strain. Uh, you know, I have this come up at times too, because like I just didn't, I just upgraded my system completely, and my main system now has six monitors, and um, they're different sizes and stuff. And I don't really like for me the whole thing with the the frames of monitors and stuff. I you know when they have them above the other and all that, because I'm used to working on the programs laterally. So so I found myself in a situation where I'm twisting my neck too much, you know, and I end up with a crick in my neck. And I realized, you know what? That's making me uncomfortable, so I'm not even looking forward to sitting down there. Physical trading environment also, the ergonomics also make sure you're comfortable with your computer. That's part of it too. Know your tools. You're comfortable with your computer, comfortable with the software. 
you know. Are you comfortable with that? I know I know some people who did very well with office as part of their kitchen, as long as you're not putting your computer on the stove and wondering why it's not working. <laughs> I heard from another famous trader. He said, "Don't trade at home, or at least, you know, don't." But don't be disturbed when you're trading at home. Okay, I think that's an individual choice. That's a very good point. That's an individual choice, though. A lot of people um, don't work well. They, you know, a lot of people even want to go to the extent of putting on a suit and tie and going to an office. I knew someone. He was actually going to be here. That's that's Jeff Richardson. Was going to be here. He was he was actually renting some space in an office, and he would put on a suit and tie and go to that office every day because it helped him feel psyched yeah. to go and do that. And that worked for him for a couple of years. And then he's like, you know what? I would be more comfortable back at home. So he can't cancel that arrangement. Um, uh, uh, what's his name? I mentioned his name before. Carter? John Carter? Yeah. He, uh, he had his office at home. Right. Just now opened an office. Okay. Well, I would think that, that I think that would make a difference if he actually ever took a trade, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Oh, they're, they're spread out on my desk laterally. I have a U-shaped desk. It's like a horseshoe desk. So I just yeah. Around yeah, and I have a chair that swivels, but as, as some of you know, I had an injury. Um, Earlier in, the, earlier in the summer, actually in the late spring, and I was told by my doctor for several months that I had to keep my feet up. So I put an ottoman under my desk, and that's why I was turning my head and getting a crick in it. So the whole thing, and, and during that time, by the way, I said I'm not trading because I was in pain from this injury. Um, and so I did the advisory stuff, but I knew I couldn't put my own money on the line. But still, it reminded me the ergonomics are bad. Gurus, trading gurus. The reason I said that was a crack about Carter, obviously. And yeah, but, but, um, Never a black box system. Never a black box system. Try to use indicators and techniques that you can actually calculate by hand. Not that you're going to want to. Not that you're not, I'm not telling you to give up computers and calculate them by hand. But if you're using something that's so calculated, so, cal so complicated, that you don't even know how to do it by hand, there's a problem because you don't know what your indicator is telling you. And I see that with some of these people who flit from indicator to indicator. I asked one guy who went from, uh, he was in the quick pop trading room and he went to try to use CCI and he said, well, why is it doing this? Why is it doing that? So I, I asked him, T, I said, can you, um, can you sit down and calculate a CCI by hand, reading? No, of course not. The computer does it. Do you know what the CCI is telling you? No, uh, it's a line. It goes up. Uh-uh. No. Know what your indicators actually are saying, because otherwise, what's up? Um, trading stuff. Is it best to stick to one thing like the US CAD, or do I add three other cards and papers? What's your take? That is a personal thing, definitely. Some people do better when they can scan several markets for their ideal setup. I say be careful getting into too many setups at once. In other words, if you don't want to look at the Gartley thing and the crown thing, just look at the idea of maintaining a pattern of higher highs and higher lows and buying on pullbacks. So that might free you up to go, you know what, USD CAD is in total chop right now, so I can also look at GBP USD. Okay, that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is to say I must master this security. I I don't really that doesn't work for me that much. I but that's my head. I'm better off looking at a few things and going, this one is setting up better than that one. Okay? That's the kind of thing that Van Tharp's work can help you with, though determining what's better for you. You commented earlier about uh, how the market has changed, it's gotten much faster, yeah. etc. Uh, volatility. Uh, right now we've gone, we're going through this economic crisis type situation. Mm -hmm. In the future, are you, are, you, are you thinking, what are your comments or what are your thoughts about Good. Probably gonna Good question. Good question. I, I think I think what has to well as far as trading the markets. Oops, that was a quarter term. As far as as far as being able to trade, I uh, you always have to be flexible and adapt. That's another thing. That's a good psychological point too. Is traders always have to adapt? Okay, there are two ways of adapting as a trader, as far as I know. One way is you get really into a certain style and a certain time frame and all that stuff. And when your market is no longer behaving in a way that's con that, that works with your style, you change markets. Okay. The other way, and they're equally good. The other way is to modify your style a little bit. So I'll give you an example. 
Uh, we've noticed shifts in the volume, some of the things that we trade in the chat room. But fib work is the same. The fib work stays the same, but we change time frames. We move to a tighter or you know tighter time frame or a slower time frame, um, especially because we're like right now. Good example out of summer. You know, for summer we had to switch to more of a scout mode if, if you're going to live, and also tighter time frames, or I should say, more open time frames, so that you weren't just looking at noise. Okay, back into the um, back into the into the fall, you look at the volume figures they're picking up. So you have to look at the market a little bit differently that way. I'm not sure if that's what you meant. Yeah, but yeah you have to stay flexible as a trader. Oh, the other thing I was going to say about no black boxes. And by the way, what I mean about indicators is read how the indicator is formed and try once to at least grasp the math of how to do it by hand. Okay, and then, then let the computer do it. But don't use an indicator if you don't actually know what it's doing. Okay, if you don't actually know what it's doing. Um, also, try to avoid automated tools. Like Fibonacci Trader has some great automated tools, which I'll show you. Um, I'm not saying avoid them, but know how to do the work manually first. All right. In other words, if I showed you a great tool that could project targets and support and resistance and all that stuff, that's wonderful. But if you don't actually know what it's calculating and you become reliant on an automated tool, it's a road to disaster because you don't really know what the program is telling you. You don't really know exactly what you're supposed to do with that information. All right, so that's important. Gurus, just, I'm not, you know, again, I'm not referring to any specific person, although I could, several. Um, try to, you know, if you're learning from a trading educator, I suggest that you try to get a feeling for whether or not that person is dedicating equal time or more time to marketing than to actually helping their clients or students, okay? Just, just take a look around on the web and see what they're actually doing with their time. And if you see that they're putting equal or more time into marketing, trolling for new clients, compared to, and I've learned this from experience, you know, big time. Um, if you see that they're putting just as much energy into trolling for new clients, how in the world do they have the energy to actually do the, whatever they're supposed to do correctly for their current clients? Okay? And that's, that may seem kind of esoteric. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about at all, but if you have looked, like Van Tharp, um, I, I guarantee you that Van Tharp is putting more energy into actually helping people than he is to marketing. That's why you guys haven't heard of him for the most part. Okay? So, you know, that's, that's it on... Yes, Leonard? I'm looking for something. I'm, I'm looking for... I, I get bored. I, I got my blue screen on my computer. Yeah. And I'm waiting for a, a trade in or something. I have my treadmill right there. Yeah. So I'll get up and I'll be in my treadmill for a while and I'll wait for something. That's great. Or whatever, and I'll get off and I'll... I'll go ahead and do that. Yeah, that was my fantasy actually for a long time. I had a fantasy, you know, when I was visualizing what I was going to build towards as a trader, I was picturing a big screen and an exercise machine. You know, and, and also of course I had the power thing of being on the phone, you know, buy, sell, buy, sell. Well, we don't need that anymore because we have this stuff. Yeah, well, I don't know about that one. But um, yeah, ergonomics, you know, that, that, that's important. That's part of what to, what to do with your time and energy. Right. There are a million ways to, here, let me show you something. This is, I, did, I didn't bring this to show it to you guys, but um, I brought it because I thought I might be using it here and I even might tomorrow. But I got a couple of these things. These are, and this is for my ergonomic use, these are little baby monitors. See? Little, and it goes either way. Little baby, little baby monitors that plug in by USB. Okay? And it's touch screen. Okay? So normally my order entry computer is this laptop. And it's off to the side. And I also have an external monitor on an arm attached to the desk that I can bring around in order to uh, see my whole quote screen. But what I did so I don't have to distract myself from the chat room and helping the people in the chat room, I didn't have to choose, do I look at my order entry or do I, my order entry is on this and it's right in front of my face. Just as, it's just a little, it's a company called Mimo. Mimo, M-I-M-O. And um, yeah, that's cool. It's very cool, and I have a couple of them. And um, it's very helpful to just, you know, I mean, from this is my my ergonomic solution. Sorry, no, no, you have to go directly to the company. I think. Sorry, what? That's what I do. Yeah, and actually, I, I've already gotten to the point where I'm doing it with touch screen. You know, so I don't have to. Yeah. This is about two hundred bucks. Two hundred bucks for the touch screen version. Yeah, but I'm not saying I'm not recommending this product for you guys. I'm saying I made an effort to solve my ergonomic issue, and and this was the easiest way. Yes. Thought last night, and I want to have any value. Mm -hmm. I was the 
went into a webinar and the person made a very valid point. Time charts really are official. For example, yes, I agree. We're in the 15 minutes, and if you use canvas, for example, which I'm familiar with, it might say, oh, this is a very candle. But the time really doesn't stop. So if you go for higher time frames, actually, a bullish candle, because keep filling. Can you get that? So because of when you, you cut that time chart, yes, it's arbitrary. That single candle is looking very and bullish. Yes. Because in forex, time doesn't stop. We have five days of total movement. Mm -hmm. And also, the realize that there's only one time in the forex market that you have a, 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 a real opening and a real close. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, why is this important? If you actually use resistance and support to mm -hmm. trade now, fifth levels are really resistance and support. Yes. But we are focusing on persistence and support. So for example, we're using a larger time frame. We're making money of, of the garlics and the crowns. Mm -hmm. But in fact, if you look at say the weekly, we are going, you know no matter what is happening and all the money you're making, that market is going to stop there. Somewhere right, the okay. Now here's my point. I found out it came to the last that the only candle that is generally a candle or a period is the weekly because it opens on a Sunday and, and closes. Okay. How important is that? It sounds like it's important to you. No, which is which is a point. What I was, what I'm actually doing is complimenting you, because are you holding up a sign? Ten minutes. Okay. Um, I you just reminded me also of, of something I want to mention of, uh, as far as psychology is concerned. Come up with ideas like that and research them. Figure out what that means to you. What does it mean to me? Uh, I don't have enough time to think about it yet. I, I use, I mean, I can answer that. Um, in my ES trading, for example, I don't use time-based charts for triggering. I use volume charts because the volume charts, volume charts mean that when a certain number of trades occur, it starts to print a new bar. Because I also think that the time factor is arbitrary. What happens with indicators also, so let's say the market is flat. The okay, market is flat, 15 minutes goes by, because of the chart, it has to start printing a new candle. So because, it's, because it prints a new candle, even if there are no trades, your indicators are going to modify how they're reading. Right? So it introduces some noise into it. Volume charts only proceed, progress, there? when there's actually trading. Yes. Unfortunately, in Forex, you can't use volume charts. Okay? Because, there's a, because the data is not centralized. You can use tick charts. You can, yeah. It's, so it's not tick charts. Transaction instead of, instead of, yeah, it's just another kind of chart. We can talk about that. Tick charts aren't as accurate, though, as they are in centralized securities either. Um, thing is, any security you trade is going to have some kind of limitation. So um, my solution to that in some of the stuff that we do trade that is centralized at an exchange is to use volume charts, okay? For the triggers, it doesn't matter for the FIB work whether you're dealing with a, a bunch of candles or what, you still need to get that stuff within the swing. You know, the pattern is still valid within the swing. Whether or not it was, think about it this way, what if we did away with the candles and just used a line chart? But that's that's where the price is going. You know, the price moved that way, whether or not you have whole bars printing with an open high low close, or you just had a line. So there are ways around that, but um, some securities are going to have more ways around it than others. Um, but what I wanted to point out is you had a good idea. You had a good. Think about it. Think about it. I'm just starting on it too. I'm. You just gave me an idea to think about. Yes. Okay. So you gave me. A, well, an argument could be made that um, Friday. All right. Yeah. There's several ways of looking at it. We can we can hash that idea out. But you also reminded me something of something on the psychological end too. Uh, people who I see who are not doing well are using a lot of negative self-talk. And a lot of what they say, again, I can think of a few people in particular, a lot of people will say, I am not smart enough to figure out a trading plan. I hear that all the time. So show me exactly what you're doing and I'm going to copy it. Now why is it not working for me? Because what I have formulated is what works for me. No one in my service, and I don't expect any of you, tries to should try to copy every single thing I'm doing. We're here so I can give you some ideas to combine with what you're doing, what you're comfortable doing. I can't force, so I can't give you an injection to make you see everything the way I see it. So you're here to get ideas about this stuff, but the worst thing you can do in general is to say, 
say, I can't come up with anything on my own. I need to take what that person is teaching me and make it work for myself. And if it doesn't work, well, there's something wrong with me or there's something wrong with it. Okay. Okay. Well, you can a lot of the stuff with Excel and graphs you can do by hand. Also, keep notes. You have to keep notes of your trades anyway. Otherwise, what do you have to study? If you don't, if you don't keep notes of how your trades are proceeding for the future study, what kind of trigger worked out? What kind of trigger didn't work out? You must keep notes, otherwise you're flying blind. All right. But my point is about the don't get into the negative self-talk either. And you just demonstrated the opposite of negative self-talk. You demonstrated a good thing because you said, I had an idea. And I don't know what I'm doing with this yet, but it's a good idea and it might be important. That's a wonderful trait to encourage in yourself. I had an idea, I want to explore this thing. If you get into the negative head instead, you know, I mean that happens, I only take the losing trades. How often do I hear that one? How, I always get in too late. I never let my profits run. I always let my losses run. What are you saying? Why are you programming yourself to believe that this is going to go on for eternity? You know? You can say, you know what, up till now I've been letting my profits uh, disappear. Up till now I've been letting my losses run. That's about to change. You should reinforce the positive. And that's what you did when you said, I had an idea. That's the opposite of saying, I'm not smart enough. If you don't think you're smart enough, you're in the wrong field. You just said you are smart enough, which is a great thing. It's a really good thing. Anything else we want to cover before lunch? Because when we get back from lunch, we're going to do triggers, trade management aspects. Okay.